Hello, hello my dears, good day to you and a very, very warm welcome. We have a fantastic topic for tonight and I have a very specific intent actually for you it's today. For me it's already evening. We have the wonderful topic of procrastination, how to self-sabotage ourselves with procrastination and I have a very specific intent for today which is to make it fun, to make it open, to make it as enjoyable as possible for us to talk about this topic. Because for most people, when we think about self-sabotaging through procrastination, it's kind of a theme that weighs us down and we feel guilty and we blame ourselves or others or our circumstances. And it's just not that joyful of a topic to contemplate and invest our energy in. So that's what we like to do is then actually procrastinate the discussion about procrastination where it's going, ah, oh, no, I don't have time for this right now. Or yeah, yeah I'm going to handle it tomorrow. And all those wonderful sayings that we've learned over time, right? So let's set your intent as well to have a great time, to be open, to trust the information, to simply see what comes up and then take the pieces that work for you that you can use in your own life and that makes sense, okay? So, like always, <sighs> make sure that you get a lot out of it, that you get a lot of value. Everybody who is here live, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody who's going to watch the video later, welcome my friends. I'm so glad you're tuning in and our numbers are growing and I'm super happy to say that our followership is growing and YouTube, you know that you can watch the videos as well there and over 200 other videos that I have on that platform that you can check out that I have collected over the last few years, all essentially on the law of attraction, on quantum NLP, on how you can raise your consciousness. Many, many different resources that I'm offering to you and many practical ways that you can apply it. All right, so I put out three specific themes for today. First of all, let's talk about what is procrastination, why do we procrastinate, and then how can we use some resources and some strategies to get out of that downward spiral of procrastination and actually motivate ourselves to do the things that we know are good for us, okay? And when I was thinking about what is procrastination, of course, I checked it out a little bit. And ultimately, what I find is the keywords are delaying, postponing, and avoiding. Uh, and each one of those, right, just drags us down to postpone, to delay, to avoid. Those are just not words that stimulate a lot of high consciousness because we all know what we're doing here. And usually, the point that we call it procrastination is because we know that we should be doing it. We know it's good for us. We know that the exercise program that we've been talking about for years would be good for us. We know that some of the dietary restrictions that are perhaps good for us and we're not doing them is actually hurting us physically. We know that there are things in our relationships that we don't take care of, where we could become better communicators, but we're too lazy, we're too trenched into our opinion and the way it is and that's what I'm believing in and that's why I'm doing it this way and don't try to change me. We're doing it with money, we're doing it with our jobs, we're doing it with our whole lifestyle and so we all have it to some degree or another. My coach Lynn told me in 2005 when I started Quantum NLP that procrastination is a normal part of life. And for me as a business owner, that was her advice then, was to concentrate on the important things. There was the list of these are the items that if I don't do it for my company or for my life, for my health, for my relationships, are going to be detrimental. They could kill the deal. They could kill the relationship. They could kill my business. And it would be really, really hard to come back from. And those are the things that I definitely want to take care of. And then there are other things that might be important. And you know what? If that I don't do it, I'm still going to get away with it. Yes, I might have some negative consequences and it's repairable. There are things that are important that I can also let slide that are okay because in the big picture, perhaps they don't matter so much. 
then there are the things that are kind of unnecessary. And actually, I'm thinking about the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, didn't even think about it in my preparation for this, that this is also a key effect, a key major piece in determining which are the important pieces that I absolutely want to take care of, that I want to make sure I focus on, because it would be detrimental. And then what are some of the things that I have on my plate that are perhaps not that important? So let's talk about the Pareto principle for a minute, because that is a super important concept that you need to understand to take some of that burden off your shoulders, okay? Pareto was an economist in Italy in the last century, and he came up with a very interesting prognosis and statistics about the distribution of wealth and land in Italy at that time. I believe it was in the 1920s. And he found out that 20% of the population owned 80% of the land. Then he started generalizing this thesis into other areas and he started to recognize that there is such a thing as what we call the 80-20 rule because a lot of times, and the numbers were really amazing how they fit in this 80-20 scheme, is that 80% of your success comes from 20% of your effort. The results you create, the whole of the results you create, is only based actually on the 20% of excellent effort that you're putting out in a specific area. So if you have a goal list of 10 items, 8 of those items are going to be more on the level of it's okay if you do it, it, is, it would be useful if you did it, it's kind of important that you do it. And then there are two, three items that are absolutely urgent and it would be detrimental if you didn't do it. So when I look at a goal list now, I automatically go into the, what's the most important. What are the items that are going to be the most useful for me to take care of? And then what are some of those that I can let slide? And that helps me to prioritize because otherwise I get overwhelmed. There's always more to do. The list just keeps growing. And as soon as I take a couple of pieces off, I put another 10 pieces on. And so being able to discern and say, okay, these are the items that are super important. These are the items that are not as important. There, I can have a choice now and say, okay, let's concentrate on the item. And I'm going to dedicate half an hour to this item right now and see what happens with it. So that's on the side about how you can deal with procrastination. So that's actually going to go into part three of what I'm talking about in strategies that you can use to help yourself overcome procrastination and self-motivate yourself, okay? All right, so the procrastination is based on avoiding, delaying, and postponing. The things that we know would be good for us to do and still we're not doing it. And why are we not doing it? And that ultimately comes down to our conditioning. You hear me talk about the RAS a lot, the reticular activating system, which is the filter in our brain that discerns which information of reality of our environment is constant bombardment of visuals, of audio. There are always sounds coming in. There's always pictures and we're seeing things around us. We're feeling things. We're constantly in contact with our environment and information is pouring in. And the RAS's job is to filter out everything that does not match the already existing patterns in our brains. And if I have a belief about not being worthy or not being good enough, or that my voice doesn't matter, then that is the information that I will attract to me and that will easily flow into my brain. And then I'm proving myself right. See, nobody listens to me. I don't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. And the information that is contra to that belief, to that specific program of our RAS, is not going to get let through. That's the whole key. And when you start to really understand that and you really start to look at your life from that perspective, it changes everything. You're going to all of a sudden see, oh, there is so much good out there and I'm just not letting it in. And I've talked to people who felt unlovable. And when I would start to explain to them the RAS and how it functions and how it might apply to them, 
they would say all of a sudden, yeah, you're right. There have been declarations of love. There have been times where people tried to make me compliments and I took it wrong or I couldn't accept it. It's because it was such a mismatch to the belief that this person had about their ability to be loved. And we're all doing it. We all have our RAS that we formed from essentially before birth. Even in the womb, we now understand the information that is around us vital, absolutely vital for our development. We know now that women who have tremendous stress during pregnancy, that there will be repercussions for the children afterwards. There are, is so, such incredible research about that. A friend of mine, Lynn, is sharing some of that with me from a point of view of psychology. And it's just fascinating to see some of the patterns that children take on from their parents and their culture that they're never consciously aware of until they start digging and they're getting deeper into it of why am I doing this? Why am I sabotaging this part of my life? It's because it's intricately associated with the experiences that your parents had when you were in the womb, when you were a little baby, when you were a little child, as you were growing up. You're constantly observing, you're constantly taking note, you're constantly sorting and you're filing and you're putting it away in a way that it's available to you when you need it. And so if you are in an abusive environment, you will have very different skills than a person who grows up in a very loving and encouraging environment. I just read something really fascinating about the success of women and how much the relationship with their fathers when they were young girls has to do with the success that they're able to create in life and how that deep bond and that trusting relationship with a male figure has a tremendous impact on women's success. Wow, blew my mind when I read that. And that's just one tiny example about the psychology of how we manage to cope with reality from a very early age on. We're constantly making decisions. We're constantly discerning. This is good. This is bad. This works. This doesn't work. Try this. Oh, that hurt. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. And so on and so on. And that's how ultimately we form a personality. That's who we are. Well, that's just how I am. That's just how I am. And those are those beliefs that drive us unconsciously, of course. A lot of times when I talk to my clients and I help them discover a belief, they say, why would I believe that? Why would I choose to believe that? That is so limiting. That's so hindering my happiness, my development, my success. And I'm still doing it. And it drives them crazy. It's amazing when someone has that kind of a breakthrough and to then start making the connection between, well, what were your life experiences? What were the circumstances that you grew up in? What was modeled to you by the people around you? And it's not just our parents. It's our neighbors. It's our school system. It's the organizations that you're part of. Where did you spend your time? And that might be a very nice discovery journey for you to actually go there and dig up some of those parts and then see how you can negotiate, how can you change the meaning of those things that happened to you and perhaps even for you. So that's when it gets really deep and I'm actually making a mental note right now because that's definitely another gathering where we are going to dive deep and we are going to go into some of those details and help heal those, okay? So that's my promise to you guys. Okay. So we're doing it because we're coping. We learned to cope. We discerned this works, this doesn't work. This gives me a positive response from the people around me. This gives me a negative response from the people around me. And what are you going to do then? Of course you're going to go for the things that are going to create a positive response for you. For example, this typical, the class clown. They learn that through joking, A, they feel better about their circumstances, and then B, people are laughing and there is encouragement. They get slapped on the shoulder. Hey, that was funny. You're cool. Ah, says the brain. Hey, I'm going to do more of that, right? And that's how we then develop skills. 
and everything can be learned. As long as it's neurologically possible for you, you can learn it. And let's go even further, because when we truly talk about neuroplasticity, then we know that we can even regenerate our bodies within just a few years. Every single cell in this body will be completely new. And all these other cells that are currently right here with me are going to be gone. And they're going to be doing something else in the universe. Isn't that fascinating? And that you can heal your brain and that you can heal your heart, that you can heal the concepts that you grew up with, the beliefs. Wow, isn't that fascinating? Because ultimately, that's all procrastination is. It's a belief that you formed over time about yourself, about the world, about work, about tasks, that put the fulfillment of tasks in that very specific category that you put into the filing system called procrastination. I remember way back when in the 90s, when I first got introduced to NLP, a friend of mine, actually Kathleen, she gave me a book on Anthony Robbins. That was my first exposure to him. And I remember actually it was an audio book. So I'm listening to it and he talks about away from pain and towards pleasure. And what he ultimately made the point of was that we will in generally move towards pleasure and we will do everything to avoid pain. And let's say that it's a dietary thing that we are eating certain things that we know are not good for us and yet that pleasure of eating it is so profound and we're having so much fun doing it until there comes that tipping point where the pain starts to outweigh the pleasure. And that's actually one of the signs of addiction. That even though we haven't had pleasure with it for a long time, but we're still doing it. And we're still hunting that pleasure. We're still trying to get that pleasure that we had that first time when we tried a certain substance or we tried a certain feeling and we did a certain behavior and we got so much pleasure out of it. And then over time, as we're repeating it over and over and over again and it, the pleasure starts going away, there comes that point where the pain actually outweighs the pleasure. And that's when we talk about hitting rock bottom. When we reach the point that the pleasure actually flips into pain and it is not pleasurable anymore to do that behavior and yet we're still doing it. So that's one way of looking at procrastination and self-sabotage because we're doing something that we know ultimately hurts us and our brains are so scrambled at that point between pain and pleasure that we have a really, really hard time to discern it. And then in those moments, to be able to motivate ourselves and to get out of our reptilian brain that is fully in fight and flight and freeze mode and actually, again, activate both hemispheres of our brain, activate our frontal lobe, where we have our discernment, we have good decision making, where we are accountable. Accountability is right up here. Procrastination is right back there. Yeah. You are in charge of it and you can change that about yourself right here and now. First of all, by making the decision that this is important to you. This is worth investigating. I want to know more. I want to educate myself. I want to learn about this. I want to learn about myself. And I'm willing to change. And that's all it takes, my dear. That's all it takes. For you to have that discernment, to know that what you're doing right now in some area of your life where you are procrastinating, and I'm not going to get into details, that's your privacy, where well, you know that it's not working for you and you're still doing it. It's the things that we do that we shouldn't and the things that we don't do that we should. That's all it is. That is all it is. We just got it swapped in our brains. Isn't that funny? Because if you did do the things that you know you should do, you're going to get the results that you want and you're not doing the things that you shouldn't do. Yeah, you're going to get the results that you want. 
And for some reason, we got that scrambled in our brains. We got it turned around in those times, in those circumstances in your life where you are procrastinating, where it just doesn't work. And then we get the results that we don't like. For me personally, it's my to-do lists. When I forget the prioritizing, when I get trapped in little nitty gritty things that are actually not really conducive to my success. When I'm doing things with a specific completion date and I keep pushing it, I keep pushing it. Oh, I still got seven days. Oh, I still got three days. Oh, I still got four weeks. <laughs> oh yeah, I know I'm in trouble. And then I create strategies for myself that help me to motivate myself and to overcome that part that says, oh, just let it lay till tomorrow. <laughs> you have that list too, don't you? I know you do. Right on. So procrastination is a coping mechanism. Procrastination is a learned behavior. You looked at the people around you, you saw what they were doing and you discerned, looks like it's gonna work. I'm gonna do it too. That's how simple it is. I'm putting it into super simple language. And why are we doing it? Because we are figuring out how the world works, who we are, what our personality is, and how we can best cruise through life with the most pleasure possible and the least pain possible. That's what our subconscious is going for. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. The word pain, pain, pain. Oh, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Oh, don't want to have anything to do with that. It might be painful, might be hurtful. <sighs> and that's just human. That's just human. We're not bad people because we're doing it, because we're just looking around us and everybody else is doing it, so we're doing our own version of it, okay? And that's okay. As long as you know that you're doing it and you have some choice about making some changes when it's useful to you. When the pain of not doing it has become so large that you're actually hurting yourself. You might be hurting yourself physically, you might be hurting yourself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you might hurt your relationships, your relationship with finances, you might actually hurt your job, your career. Take some stock right now, just check it out. Where are you hurting yourself the most? Where does your unwillingness to take action in specific areas really hurt you and is detrimental to your future? Let's go there right now. Take a moment, breathe deeply, and just be really honest with yourself right now. Where am I hurting myself the most? Where am I doing things that I shouldn't be doing? Where am I not doing things that I should be doing? knowing that it's going to affect myself right here, right now, and in the future. Okay. So, on the level of self-discovery, where do I want to go today? Procrastination, of course. I know exactly where it's at, it's the diet. And what I shouldn't be doing is eating as much sugar as I do. Mm. And what I should be doing is eat a lot more fresh stuff than I do. <laughs> so here we go, there it is. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure is the sugar. Pain, pain, pain is the salad, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a real issue. And sometimes I'm doing better than other times. So I'm gonna deal with that today because that's a worthy one that I know is going to affect me in the future by making some different choices right now. Okay, so you're getting some ideas for yourself as well? Right on. And of course, once you watch the recording, you can always stop it, take some notes. You know I'm a big note taker, so make sure you got some paper and pencil or some note taking device. And really give yourself the chance to go deeper with it, okay? So first of all, I'm going to give you some surface strategies. One of my favorite strategies when I first got into NLP was the motivation strategy. And the secret of the people who are naturally motivated, one of the secrets of people who are naturally motivated is that they are able to visualize 
the completed result of their task. So when you're talking with someone about doing laundry and they really don't like doing laundry and they still do it, even so they don't like the tedious having to go to the laundromat or having to go into their basement or upstairs and having to sort the laundry and all those little tedious steps that are included in doing laundry and they're still doing it. Why? What's the difference between you doing it and the other person who has a big stack sitting in your bedroom? It's because those people actually visualize the end result of having all the laundry perfectly folded and hanging up and it's all ironed and whatever your strategy is, and it's done. And you look at the completed result going, yeah, I did it. Good job. Well done. It's done. Okay, what's next? What else do I want to do? Do it with dishes. Instead of concentrating and focusing and obsessing about the act of doing the dishes and looking at it like, oh my God, it's such a big pile and big pots and oh my goodness, there's like a hundred pieces when I'm looking at all of it. I have to do all these dishes. Imagine visualizing everything being perfectly put away in its place. The counters are clean. For me, a clean kitchen is when the counters are clean. That is my pleasure. Once I've cleaned the surface of the cooking area, once I've cleaned the counters, it's that ah, I can even feel it. It feels so smooth when I go over the granite and it feels wonderful. Other tasks, think about work. You might be working on a project and you're overwhelming yourself because it has so many components, there are so many pieces, and the project takes two months. Oh my goodness, what a long timeline. And to imagine yourself in the future having the project completed, celebrating the success of the results that you have created. That's what motivates you to dig in every day and take care of those little points that little list of checks, checks, check. Okay, I gotta do this and I gotta do that and I gotta do that. Because you know that ultimately you're working towards something very special and it's gonna be worth it. See, even Stephen Covey talks about it. Begin with the end in mind. That's his version of it. That's how you motivate yourself to get things done. Because you understand that there is that result that you're going towards too. There is going to be a completion point, just like when you're running a marathon, there will be the goal line. There will be a finish line. There will be a point when this specific activity is going to stop. And knowing that can be such a driving force. It can be such a motivator for you that is going to make it so pleasurable that the pain of the little steps that you might have to take right now that are not as pleasurable to you are totally worth it. The overall pleasure of reaching the goal far outweighs the pain that you're currently experiencing making yourself do those little steps. Does that make sense? So that is a very surface strategy actually because it's just behavioral. You are starting to visualize yourself in that environment of your task and you imagine yourself having done it. Then you're saying positive things to yourself. I did it. It's done. Oh my goodness, it turned out so much better than expected. This was easier than I ever hoped for. Wow, it was totally worth it. People who are on an exercise program, people are on a special diet program, when they then tell that story about how they dropped 50 pounds and how much better they feel now, how much more energy they have, or they went through a specific surgery and they were able to heal a part of their body, or they did something for their mind, for their emotions. They started a meditation program or something else that they know helps their emotional and mental well-being. Or they're doing things that are opening up their spiritual perception, their spiritual life. You can see it in people's eyes when they tell their story. And every time when someone tells a story like that, that is an absolute reason to celebrate because you know 
that in that moment the person did something in their brain, in their mind, that helps them to focus on the positiveness of the outcome versus the negativeness of the steps they had to take right now. And then over time, actually, the steps can turn fun too. And we're starting to let go of that perception that it's painful, and that we don't want to do it, that we have to do it, we have to make ourselves do it, and we have to set that alarm, oh, I gotta go to the gym, or I gotta take that walk, or whatever it is, I gotta do that task. It becomes a joy, you're looking forward to it, you're anticipating it, because you start to understand, and it's gonna ch neurologically change in your brain at that point, that it's good for you, and it's going to get you to the results that you want. So let's go much deeper now, because I already mentioned the RAS. So the reason that you are having your current patterns is because you learned them. And the question is, where did you learn them and why did you learn them? How did you learn them? From whom did you learn them? So look around in your life right now. Go back into the past. Look at your life as a whole. And just notice some of the people that you were exposed to as a child, as a youngster, and how they dealt with procrastination. So perhaps you did grow up with a parent who was absolutely frantic about everything has to look perfect all the time. The house has to be clean. Your room has to be clean. Da, 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 da. Everything has to be on its place. Someone who's obsessing about organization and cleanliness. Let's say that was one of your parents. And the other parent was a slob. Always leaving their clothes laying around, never finding their keys, always being late. And the kid looks at it and goes, huh, gee, that's interesting. You do it like this and you do it like that. Wow. And then, of course, it also has to do with our relationship with that specific parent, how we're relating with them, how do they relate to us, how do they inform us, how do they engage with us on a normal basis. And then you feel find that you're tending a little bit more towards one idea. Perhaps you become even judgmental about the other. And that's what one of my coaches, Larry, told me in the beginning of my training, that, for example, in alcoholism, when the child sees the parent coming in from work and they're all exhausted and they're really upset about all the stress they had all day, oh, now I'm going to have a beer first and ah, they have their beer and now I'm going to relax and ah, and then all of a sudden the parent becomes fun and engages with the child. And the kid looks at it and goes, hmm, so I see what you're doing. And then usually there are two choices that the child unconsciously makes. I'm going to do what you're doing because I see how it works for you. And so every time I'm going to be stressed out, I'm going to go to some substances and I'm going to help myself change my state and then I can engage with my family and be a fun person. Or they say, oh, I don't like that. I don't like this behavior. I don't like how you need to do these specific things, these rituals to get yourself in a good place. And I'm not going to do that. And that's why you have such a dichotomy in families where some people will do exactly what their parents are doing and some people will do the opposite and they will reject what the parents are doing and they will do something different. This is a pretty harsh example that I just used and I know it brings the point across. So what did you observe in your parents and your caregivers, your caretakers? How did they engage with reality through behaviors, substances, thoughts, patterns? And then what are the decisions that you made? Did you look at one parent? I'm going to use the clean and sloppy example. Perhaps the person who was very clean was also the dis disciplinarian in your house. And so there might be some confusion about that strictness that this person has as a manager, as the disciplinarian, the parent, the accountability partner, and their cleanliness and organization. 
and the sloppy one was the fun one that always played with you. Who do you think you're going to tend to become more like? Now let's switch it. Let's say that the organized person was also the fun one and the sloppy one was the one that was unavailable and actually didn't have time for you. Again, you would form some different beliefs. So it really depends on your very own personal circumstances, how this all plays out. Every person is different. Every person is completely individual and unique in how they are forming those beliefs in their mind about what's been happening around them. It's that meaning that we're attaching to these circumstances. And it's that meaning that drives our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. Ultimately, our results that we create. So right now, you can just look at your life and look at the results that you have. Where are you at physically? How does procrastination play into that? Where are you at mentally, emotionally, spiritually? How does procrastination fit into that? For many years, I knew that meditation is a wonderful thing. And I always thought to myself, I should meditate, I should meditate. Gosh, if it's just five minutes, I can do it, I can do it, but I, I just didn't. It took me years, years before I first did it after I heard the words and how useful it is and how many people are doing it and the incredible results they're getting. Why did it take me so long? Why did I keep this little story in my brain about, yeah, yeah, one day I'm gonna do it. And still every day when it was like, just sit down, just sit down for five minutes and shut your mouth, put on some music and just go on or breathe, just go. Breathe in and breathe out, put a smile on your face. I knew it, I consciously knew it, what I could be doing to get better results, to help my brain calm down, my thoughts to get more quiet, to get some breathing room. And then once I started doing it, ah, it became such a wonderful habit and I'm so grateful for it. And it's been over 14 years now that I can look back on doing it and loving it. And now it's like one of the most normal things. I did it before I started talking to you guys. I put some of my favorite music on and just whoosh, zoned out. A lot of times I do it with dancing where I just do some slow motions. I do it when I'm walking and just breathing, just giving myself the experience of taking several deep breaths. And again, there's all that research to back this up. I sabotaged myself for so many years knowing what would be good for me, not doing it. Knowing that I would immediately start creating different results if I just did this little behavior for five minutes, two, three times a day. Isn't that incredible? And you're probably doing something like that as well. Things that you know would help your spirituality, things that you know would help your mind your heart and you're still not doing it. So take my example, please, as a warning story to not waste all that time, all that energy. And the funny thing is, here's another piece about procrastination. It is a waste of time because I've caught myself many times when I was procrastinating very specific tasks and I would think about it for a couple of months or even if it was just a few weeks, how much time did I already spend on that subject without getting anything done versus just doing it? Do it once, then it's done. Then you're not going to waste the next 10 weeks thinking about it and beating yourself up and blaming and finding excuses and all that brain power that I invested into this. I've done so many times that funny little pattern that's starting to become a little bit more easy to catch myself when I'm doing it saying, I'm thinking about this for the tenth time right now that I should be doing X, Y, Z. And I know I'm going to do it anyway because it's going to get done at some point. It's one of those. It's going to get done. And I've already probably wasted two hours 
on something that would probably take me 15 minutes to complete. Isn't that silly? And when that happens, it goes right there on the list. And then perhaps it even gets moved up in the Pareto principle of the 80-20 rule that it's that important that I will say, okay, this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. For example, I'm still using my accountability sheets. I did it yesterday again. There's always the intent for the week. These are my three main goals. I actually have this in several of our groups as an attachment. These are the three key things that I want to do. So I look at my long list and my list is always more than 10 pieces. And where is it right now? Right here behind me. Here's the quickie. And then I look at it and say, okay, which one of those are the most important ones that I want to take care of this next week? And there they go. Then I have an affirmation that is going to help me stay focused. I also look at my self-sabotage part. I call it the learning lessons that I'm going to experience. You might also call them the roadblocks. This is how I can get myself in trouble. I don't have enough time. I'm not in the right place. I have too much going on to do this, that kind of stuff, okay? And then these are the resources that I need and that I have. What is going to allow me to close the gap between what I have and what I want? And here's something else that is super important this is something special I will do for myself this week. And I've been filling out these sheets since 2009, when I first came up with it as a piece, as a resource that I can give to my students to hold themselves accountable for the things that they want in life. And so by writing it down, these three things are the most important things for me to do this week. I have a very, very different level of buy-in this is my witness program, so to speak. By having this written down, I also share it with my mastermind group friends and they hold me accountable on that. So make sure that you create systems for yourself and it can be a buddy that you're attracting in your life, a family member, for example, Sean, he checks in with me every day. How's your book coming? Have you been writing on your book? Are you already editing? Those kind of things. And then I get to say either, hey man, I already put it in an hour today. Or like, I haven't done anything in two days. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Uh, I got to put it higher on my list again. And I have so much accountability in my life for different things, especially when I'm traveling and I spend a lot of time alone and I have to manage myself without having that input from loving family members and a circle of friends, my students, my clients. So you are in charge of how this journey goes, my dear. You get to determine and discern how easy you're going to make it on yourself or how much you're going to suffer. Create the environment that is going to be conducive for you to get it done. If it's about, I'm going to go very basic here, if it's about creating a nice, clean, livable environment for yourself and you have a tough time with that. Or let's say you always have the overflowing desk or the never-ending to-do list that just totally freaks you out when you look at it and go, where do I even start? Okay, anything like that. What is a better way for you to do it? And how can you create your environment in a way that it's conducive for you to do it, that it naturally motivates you to want to do it? And it might be setting a timer. I now have four alarms every day, one in the morning, late morning, early afternoon, and late afternoon that are just giving me some pings. And it's just a little reminder, how much have you been writing today? How much have you immersed yourself in that material that which you're creating right now? How much have you done on social media? How much have you done in correspondence with your clients, your students, and so on and so on. And all that gets triggered with that little alarm. It's just that little check-in. Have you done it? Have you done enough? That gets you forward. Have you done taking care of the things that you know are important? And that's just a good feeling when by the third alarm I'm going, Hey, 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 
I've already invested two hours today in this and that. And hey, I've taken two walks already. And yeah, I had some awesome fruit salad today. And we had some awesome salad this afternoon. Things like that. It's just a quick little check-in. That's just a tiny little thing that I found personally works really, really well for me. Setting alarms with reminders. And there are so many fabulous apps nowadays, right? Are you using them? Or you just have them sitting on your phone and are not using them? Uh, right there, you already know what's up. And then when you get the reminder, are you doing it? Or are you finding excuses to say you're going to do it later, right? <laughs> Oh, we all have our mechanisms. We all have our strategies. We're hilarious, aren't we? So what it really boils down to of why we're doing it and bringing it back to the RAS is because you've learned to deal with life on a certain level. You have put patterns and habits in place that are keeping you safe and protected. See, we can only grow when we move out of our comfort zone, but that's the scary part, being out of our comfort zone. We will do anything to protect our comfort and to stay in that zone, that little circle that we've created ourselves. This is my reality. This is how it works. Here I'm safe. Here I can function. And that might be something about your weight. That might be something about your finances. Half Eker talks about the financial ceiling, that glass ceiling that we put on ourselves that we're not able to exceed because that is what we believe we deserve, for example, financially or on the level of success in our career. Oh, I can only go this far. It's a safety mechanism, nothing else. Because it's scary to push outside of our boundaries, out of our comfort zone. Robert Dills, one of my favorite NLP teachers, told us in the 90s, if you want change, you need to get 10% out of your comfort zone. If you want really big change and transformation, you need to be 90% out of your comfort zone. And I always remember that. And whenever I get scared and I'm like, oh, I'm pushing against my comfort zone, this is really uncomfortable. And you know what? One of those things for me is walking into a crowd. Terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. When I was a youngster, I was going all with my shoulders hunched over, would make myself small, and I hope nobody recognizes me, I hope nobody sees me. Oh, I was so shy, it was painful. And that's why I'm so grateful for NLP, because it helped me to understand what I was doing, and it gave me choice to do something different. And now it's not a big deal anymore. I'm actually going to go to a major event and I was able to score a ticket for it. And then people asked me, you're going to go there by yourself? And I'm like, yep, I am. Because within five minutes, I know I will make new friends. And that's my attitude now. If you would have told me that 40 years ago when I was a teenager, hey, just do that. Uh-uh, I find every reason to stay home and not have to engage in that kind of activity. So you can change your RAS, you can change your beliefs, and you can keep the protection and the safety that those beliefs have afforded you over time in your past. Because that's why you formed them in the first place. They were what made sense at the time. With the experiences that you had and what you were exposed to, it made sense to start believing that perhaps saying your opinion out loud is not a good idea because people would shut you down or ridicule you. Perhaps you learned that it was not safe for you to be you, your flamboyant, crazy self who loves to dance and sing and be in front of people because people ridiculed you and rejected you, calling you loud and obnoxious. And then you just kind of adapted you got quiet. And we all have that to some degree or another in certain areas. For some of you, it's on a financial level. For some of you, it's about relationships. For some of you, it's about your deservingness to embrace happiness, love, fun. What is that one saying? 
that uh, when you have fun, then something bad has to happen. I don't even know what it is, but you know what I'm talking about, right? If you're having too much fun, something bad's gonna happen. That's one of those crazy sayings. I'm like, oh my God, how can it get more self-sabotaging than that? You're so screwing yourself with that kind of a belief. Whenever I'm too happy, something bad happens. Something like that, right? Someone type it in so I remember. Yeah, it's one of those things that makes absolutely no sense. I worry, so I don't get disappointed. That's another one of those Murphy's Law kind of stuff. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> I didn't grow up with that. Ah, you guys, no pain, no gain is another one of those. Yeah. So you have the choice to change that. And what I want for today is that you're just going to open that door. That you allow yourself to just get a glimpse of the possibility of how it would be that you can still be protected and safe and you're going to be loved, accepted, you belong, you're a part of the human family, your neighborhood, your family, your circle of friends, you're being appreciated, you're being respected without having to sabotage yourself. Hmm? How would that be? Where you can be your true self in all its glory and just live your life to the fullest. Just give yourself that for a moment. And then the big question is, what stops me from having that? That's a very deep question. Why am I not doing it when I know it's so much fun and so wonderful and so happy and I'm still not doing it? What stops me? Who stops me? Why does it stop me? Start asking those questions in those moments. Those little beliefs pop up because it's not worth it, because I'm afraid. Because I can't do it. Why can't you do it? Well, I'm just not good enough. I'm just not smart enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not educated enough. Oh man, the list just goes on and on and on. When you really start digging deep, you will come up with some really powerful answers to why you're doing it. And what you can do in those moments is you have a conversation with yourself. That part of you that is holding that belief. And you can imagine it like a psychological part or a literal part of you. Or, well, it's in my heart or it's in my back shoulders, it's in my lower back or it's in my knee, it's my foot. Ah, it's, it's right there, back there in my brain. There is an actual energy that is attached to that belief, to that part of your RAS. We talk about the shadow work. We talk about parts. And that's the language that we love to use in NLP. The parts of us that sabotage us, the parts of us that hold a specific belief. And you can get in contact with that part. Now, I always love to think about it like talking to a child, a frightened child, or a part of yourself that is younger, or a part of yourself that's smaller. A part of you that is somehow feeling diminished, not heard. A lot of times when I talk with people about those parts, they haven't had a good relationship with those parts. Who loves their part that makes them do bad stuff? Quote, bad stuff. Stuff that doesn't help them, let's say it like that. That sabotages them. Usually we're conditioned to want to discard those parts. We want to get rid of them. We don't want to deal with them. We don't like them. Sometimes we hate them. We're like, ah, if I only didn't have this part, I would be so much better, right? So what I'm going to offer to you today, and that's pretty deep, you need to forgive this part. You need to forgive yourself. You need to learn to have a relationship with that part. And that's what I want to leave you with today. That if you only do that for the next few days and concentrate that every time that you start beating yourself up 
for the things that you haven't done, that you should be doing, the things that you should be doing that you haven't done. <sighs> and just give yourself that wave of love and understanding, compassion and forgiveness. I know there's a reason I'm doing this. I know I just learned it this way. I know there are other options. And I know that I can change this. And that's all it takes as that first step for you to start getting into a different relationship with yourself and your parts, especially the parts that sabotage you through, for example, the behavior of procrastination. For those of you who want to have a lot more accountability in your life, I'm going to have another master's class coming up on Saturday the 11th of February. And I will continue those as long as there's interest and people asking me about it. I will offer those classes. They have been absolutely tremendous and I'm inviting you to join me. And I'm also announcing that my book is coming out in the middle of April and I have some really wonderful events planned for you guys online and offline. So I hope I get to see a lot of you because man, it's been way too long, especially in the USA, in the Utah area where I reside. And I haven't been able to travel as much in the US as I used to and visit my friends there. So I'm looking very, very much forward to connecting with many of you and making new friends, everybody on YouTube, you guys, thank you for your support and for tuning in. And I know we're getting a global audience and that I get the opportunity to meet you in person someday. That would be fantastic. I've made so many friendships with people from all over the world. And I have had the fortune to see many of you in person. And of course, I will also have a lot of online events leading up to the book release in the middle of April. Okay. So for today, any kind of avoidance, delaying and postponing that you're doing from now on, I would like for you to be able to take a deep breath. And just give yourself that quick little moment of, ah, I'm doing it. Create that awareness, practice that awareness. That's the first step that you're simply acknowledging what is and you're okay with it. Without judgment, without any kind of blame or criticism, you're simply taking notice. I'm doing it. It's happening right now. And it's okay. Because that's what I learned and that's all it is. You're not bad because you're doing it. You just were really good at learning a skill. That's all it is, my friend. And then you can take it from there with very specific strategies that I already mentioned. The motivation strategy where you begin with the end in mind. You keep focusing on the end result. Later on, I'm going to clean my workspace here. I have a very specific setup for this video today. And then I'm going to clean it up before I go to bed. There is still a couple of items I want to take care of this evening. There's a little show I want to watch with my sister that I'm looking forward to. A conversation I want to have with my parents. And I can look forward to once it's all done and then I go to bed and I'm like, that was awesome. I did it all. Check. Well done. So give yourself that, that you start with the end in mind, that you're visualizing, you're focusing on the end result. And then the little steps to get to the end result will fall into place. The other thing is that self-acknowledgement and start unraveling that very specific system that you have in your RAS, in your belief system, that very specific habits, that very specific pattern of how you think about yourself and life, other people, the world. And give yourself the compassion, give yourself the self-forgiveness, give yourself that feeling of acceptance that it is what it is for right now while you're on your journey to changing it. So you can right now visualize the end result of you being a highly motivated person who gets these things done. When I wrote my first book, I had a very deep belief that I'm not a writer. I kept saying to myself, why am I writing a book? I'm not a writer. I'm not a writer. 
And I kept beating myself up while I was writing. And that was in 2005. Thought into Manifestation was my first title. And then with the second book, it got a little easier from personal to global transformation. And I stopped saying that to myself because at that point I had proven to myself that I can write and that I'm having fun doing it. And then it got easier and easier. And now it's not even a topic anymore. Of course, I'm a writer. It's what I love to do. And so many times I catch myself, even after the shower or I'm driving, where I'm like, oh, I got to remember that thought. And then the next chance I get, I'm just typing in my phone or I make a little voice memo or I'm grabbing my computer and write it down. And that's how a lot of my material happens. It's just little flashes that are coming to me while I'm doing fun stuff. And that thought, I'm not a writer, mm -mm, hasn't crossed my mind in years. And now I can fully claim it that I am a writer. I am an author. And it's fun. So that's, my friend, what I wish for you. That whatever you're beating yourself up over and you cannot accept as part of your identity or personality, that you're going to start changing that. And like I promised, I will go deeper into the idea of how to change those beliefs. And actually, you can already look on YouTube for some of my videos that are definitely going into that arena, especially in my Law of Attraction playlist. I definitely talk about the RAS. I definitely talk about belief changing, how to change our memories, give them different meaning. And then we're going to see each other again next week, talking about other topics that are also related with resilience, because resilience is still the umbrella that I'm holding over this whole topic of the law of attraction and how we can manage our energy to have a better experience in life. That is my offering to you, my friends. I'm going to be here for you every Tuesday for the next few months. You can catch me on Facebook Live on my wall and then you can watch my videos on YouTube as well. So please tell your friends, tell your family, share it with your colleagues, share it at work. These skills are universally applicable in every area of your life because those are meta skills. And when you start to change your thinking, your feeling and your actions, you're going to make miracles happen. And that is my greatest wish for you, that you may have many wonderful experiences over these next few days that are going to show you that you got some value out of what I shared with you today and that you're willing to apply it. Have fun, my friends. Enjoy it. And I'm going to see you again. Till then. Bye-bye.